Over the past five episodes, we've taken a close look at the tragedy of the RMS Titanic, from its construction to its destruction, and the stories of the crew members and passengers on board in those final, fateful days. And though the journey of the Titanic itself came to an end over a hundred years ago on April 15th, 1912, its story did not. In the centuries since its sinking, the Titanic has become a legend of both history and popular culture, in no small part thanks to James Cameron's 1997 film starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet. Jack and Rose were, of course, entirely fictional, but the film did feature some of the key figures we've talked about throughout the series, including Captain Edward Smith, the unsinkable Molly Brown, Charles Joggin, Colonel Archibald Gracie IV, and violinist Wallace Hartley. Meanwhile, numerous expeditions have investigated the wreck of the Titanic, revealing new information about the tragedy itself, as well as illuminating the lives of those who went down with the ship. Today we'll be discussing all of that and more in the final episode of our six-part series on the Titanic, The Legacy of the Doomed Ship. I'm all interesting staff writer Kalina Fraga. And I'm all that's interesting staff writer Austin Harvey, and this is History Uncovered. So that song that you just heard is Nearer My God to Thee, which most people reported was the song that the band played as the as the ship went down. And it's been playing um, throughout this, this series as well. Yeah. Yeah. Also prominently featured in the movie mm-hmm. as I think during that scene as well. I think that's what the band starts playing. They do. Yeah. So there have there has been debate about that. Some people say they might have been playing the song Autumn, mm-hmm. but most widely agreed on that it was near my god sea yes so it was not the only thing from the real story of the titanic that james cameron used in the film so we're gonna get into some of the film versus real life things now that we're experts on the titanic (laughs) given how much research we've done yeah we are (laughs) yeah yeah they actually gave me an honorary phd (laughs) just in titanic studies nice very good all right well the first first thing a question that's commonly asked is is there a real like rose and the question the answer is a bit complicated actually yeah for the most part jack and rose are fictional characters Mm -hmm. but there was inspiration from james cameron who was reading a book was it a book about or a book by this woman i'm not sure i think it was about her i believe i don't think she was an author she was a potter mostly Mm -hmm. um this woman named beatrice wood who, as he was writing, realized that the character of Old Rose featured in the movie basically had like a lot in common with Beatrice Wood. Hmm. Yeah. His his quote about it, I don't I don't have it directly, but it was essentially like it's part Beatrice Wood, part fictional elements. But essentially, you can see a ton of Beatrice Wood in Rose and vice versa. Yeah, which is kind of I thought it was kind of funny reading about it because Beatrice Wood as a young woman was was not very much like Rose at all. Like she was kind of a free spirit and she like fell in love all the time and like wore toe rings and like had kind of like a crazy life. And then I guess James Cameron thought that they had this similar like fearlessness maybe and like a streak of independence yeah. and especially in their older years. Beatrice would deli- live to be 105. So yeah, but she, James Cameron has said, yeah, she is, uh, like you said, a main inspiration for Rose. <laughs> the actual character did not right. exist. Yeah, and he did actually meet her at one point as well Mm. to confirm his belief, I guess. I don't know if that was before or after the movie, but I do know he met her at some point. Wow. Well, one of the characters that's more firmly rooted in reality is uh, Molly Brown, the unsinkable Molly Brown, they called her, um, played by... Played by Kathy Kathy Bates. Bates. Mm -hmm. I love Kathy Bates. I think her story, I mean, she could be in a movie like all by herself, if you ask me. Oh my God, yeah, easily. And it doesn't, and it could go beyond the Titanic because... The rest of her life was so remarkable and eventful as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they call her the unsinkable Molly Brown because she survived multiple ship sinkings, not just the Titanic. Well, she's, yeah, just an incredible person. Um, Yeah. I think there's, like, a lot of her gumption, I guess, is portrayed well in the film of her, like, pushing back against... That guy in the lifeboat, I think, is in the movie, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it is. I can't remember if that... There's a deleted scene, and then there's the actual scene. But there, they do show her confrontation with him mm-hmm. in the movie. And it's one of those kinds of things where the dialogue basically remained unchanged from the stories you hear. Yeah, which is really cool. So, yeah. There's also, like, this part of her story where, like, she once they were rescued, went around and like badgered all the first class passengers for money for all the people who lost like everything, the third class 
um, people who try to start a new life and lost their money and clothing and loved ones. And then I think she raised like $10,000 by the time they docked in New York, which is pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And she basically kept doing that the rest of her life, too. She was like a very prominent activist. Yeah, she was. When World War One broke out, she like she was like, well, I better go to Europe and like open a relief station. <laughs> She's fearless. Yeah. Hey, good on you, Molly. Unsinkable. <laughs> Unsinkable. Unsinkable and unstoppable. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, another one, he had a very small uh, moment in the film, which I think it, unless you you've seen the Titanic movie, right? Full thing or I have. Not. <gasps> oh, my God. It comes out. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I brought this up the other day and my girlfriend got so mad at me too. And then she was like, we're going to watch it right now. And I was like, I'm so tired oh though. My gosh. It's so it is long. a long movie. <laughs> it's like, well, it's like three hours there, and 14 there's minutes. There's a very brief scene in the movie where like the ship is sinking and these people are like stuck behind a door. And I think in the, in the movie, Jack like shoulders the door open mm -hmm. and the white star line guy gets kind of huffy about it and says, you know, you have to pay for that, which is really stupid because the ship is sinking. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that was based on a real thing that happened um, when this this young tennis player named R. Norris Williams was with his father, kind of like wandering the ship as it was sinking, not sure what to do. And he shouldered open a door and got the same response from a White Star Lines guy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's little things like that, I think, are really yeah. cool that James Cameron, like, <laughs> found somehow and picked out and decided to portray in the yeah. film. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's something we'll talk about later, too. But I think it helps that there are so many first person accounts of what yeah, happened. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, yeah. I mean, you and I know we've had to pull quotes from so many survivors throughout the yeah. past like two months. There's a lot of options. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really surprising one. And then um, just like, yeah, the way these things found their way into the movie, which is next up on our list, is through the the elderly couple mm -hmm. in bed. Um, being Ida and Isidore Strauss, who were a real couple on the Titanic. And this was another one of those, like, since I'm the one who mixed our TikToks, I found the deleted scene of the two of them arguing about whether or not Ida would get on the life or whether, yeah, whether she would get on the lifeboat while Isidore stayed behind. Mm -hmm. And they, again, pretty much unchanged dialogue yeah. from her quote of saying like, as we live, so shall we die together. You can see that in that deleted scene from the movie. And it's like, <laughs> I can't imagine saying something so meaningful <laughs> in my life that it just is in a movie verbatim. Right, yeah. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. But then when you see what these people said to each other, it's like, yeah, why would you change that? Cause that's yeah. like so endearing and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The truth is more powerful than anything you could come up with. Yeah, I mean, yeah. in the movie itself, it's a very, it's like a brief, I think it's part of like a montage of like things that are happening on the ship. And there's a brief scene of like them in bed mm -hmm. as like the water is rising. But yeah, you know, in New York, there is a statue like dedicated to them in the Upper West Side. Oh, wow. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Because he was a big deal. He was the co-founder of Macy's. So like. Oh, okay. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, very wealthy guy. Wow. Yeah. So there, it's, it's a cool, it's a cool memorial. Um. I have to check it out next time I'm in New yeah. York. Yeah, I think one of the most wrenching moments in the film and from the actual sinking is the the band uh, playing. Yeah, and that I think is just like a yeah, it's like a lot to unpack there. I mean, the first thing is like the song that they played, which people disagreed on, which I think is really interesting. Right. I guess maybe you're not really like if you, in a moment of panic, are you really like, oh man, I wonder what tune yeah, that is though. Right. <laughs> I mean, most people said it was. Um, uh, near my near god, my to, god thee. to thee but yeah. charles lightoller who's the second officer was like it, they wouldn't have played that song because people would have been like panicking and knowing that it was the end and it was not very like a cheery song to play um right. but most people said that's what they heard except for harold bride who was one of the uh radio operator guys he said it was mm -hmm. it was autumn right. i don't know it's like difficult to say and then the, the violinist the main guy yeah. Walls hartley before the sinking, someone asked him, what song would you play if a ship was going down? And he said, nearer, I can't remember this, nearer my God to thee. So, well, I mean, the way in, I, so I have seen this scene from the movie. I haven't seen the full thing, but I did see this scene because this is actually also the montage starts with the violinist mm -hmm. looking, holding up the violin, starts playing nearer my God to thee. That is the same montage that has the Strausses in mm -hmm. it as well. Okay. But yeah, yeah you can. I, it's a very cool moment, regardless of what song they played. Yeah, I think it is one of those things that like translates really well to a movie because then you have this like. Let me put my my film school hat on for a moment. You have this diegetic musical element that is 
incredibly emotional and like effectively a score, but you can see how like something like that could be so impactful for people yeah, who would have been on definitely. board. Definitely. And it's a, a brave sacrifice on their part too to keep playing music because yeah. the ship's going down. Can't even imagine. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you're a musician and you're going out, that's probably how you want to go out. I too. guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I've been. <laughs> I don't know. I've never been in that situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, I guess for the next one, the the captain, I don't have too much to say on except that I always forget that it's Bernard Hill who plays him, who's Theoden from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm always like, oh, yeah, it's you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, the captain stuff's really interesting because so many of the accounts on what he did mm. vary so wildly. Yeah. Because some people were like admiring his his bravery and saying he was like holding children up out of the water as it was going under mm -hmm. and um other people say that he was basically useless and panicking didn't know what to do and that light toller did all of the organization mm -hmm. of it in those final moments and I, we can get into it later but how much of the blame for what happened falls on the captain and how much of it was just pure bad luck and, yeah yeah. Right. It's an interesting debate. I'm I'm not here to give an answer. It's not my I'm not, you know, uh -huh. that's not I'm not the authority on whether or not people are good or bad people in moments of crisis, but mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it is an interesting debate. He did go down with the ship, which, you know, He did go down with the ship. But there's something which there, is, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I guess the biggest question people ask about the Titanic movie is uh, this is a big spoiler. But I'm sorry, the movie has been out since 1997, so Yeah, it's almost 30 <laughs> years now. At the very end, Jack and Rose survived the sinking, but they're on this like wooden door and there's only room <laughs> for Rose on the door, even though it's a pretty big door. And Jack is in the water and he's gets hypothermia and just kind of like sinks down. And so everyone's like, well, like he clearly could have fit on this door. Like if you just look at from because there's I think there's like an above angle and there's enough room. Um, right. I guess James Cameron has found this like very annoying because it, it's like beyond it's not the point. It's like Jack has to die. There, there's no way he was going right. to survive for this to be like as, you know, profoundly emotional as it is. Right. Yeah. If he yeah, if he had lived at the end of the movie, I don't think it, it still would have been good. But it would have been like, why? What was the point of any of that? Yeah. Other than just to show a recreation of this bad event. I think that would have taken some of the punch out of it. If Jack had like if there had been Definitely. like a happy ending, Definitely. you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's also like insensitive. Yeah. Right. So um, there have been like yeah. different studies, like actually studies about this. And they've come to different conclusions about whether or not Jack could have fit if they'd like repositioned themselves or use their life jackets more effectively. Um, but again, the point is that Jack like had to die. So he did. Right. Yeah. Storytelling over realism in that moment, which like, well, that, what is that? That's suspension and disbelief. You just kind of have to let it mm -hmm. go. <laughs> at a certain point just be like yeah okay that you know yeah my advice to anyone if you're upset about the ending of the titanic you're supposed to be <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> stop nitpicking everything just let things be things yeah right exactly and james cameron had a funny quote where he was like he's like well like romeo you know could have like thought things through and like not killed himself when he thought that you know <laughs> right. but that would ruin the story so Titanic sinks, but then the ship is missing for like over 70 years and it takes a long right. time and like, one very dedicated person to finally find it in 1985, whose name I think Yeah, is, I think me. Robert Ballard. Yes. I wrote it down. Thank you. Robert yeah. Ballard. I was reading an account of him finding the wreck finally and like he had to make this crazy deal with like the US government to secretly find nuclear subs that had sank and things like that mm -hmm. and then they finally found it and they were like yay we found it let's open the champagne and they realized it was like 2 a.m and it's like the same time the ship like finally sank and they were like oh, oh. maybe we shouldn't open the champagne this is like a grave site you know so they didn't yeah but since then there have been a lot of incredible artifacts from the seafloor and from like survivors along the way which kind of captures some I don't know, like that moment in time pretty provocatively. Yeah. Well, interesting too, like the the things that ended up being preserved and then excavated from the site, like after 70 years at the bottom of the ocean, some of the th like, um, for example, Wallace Hartley's violin, mm. they found it 
and it's I mean it's a violin it's made of wood it's amazing that it's still well, they, they did find the violin like pretty soon after the wreck actually because I, I was reading about it he he strapped it to his chest and then he was in a life jacket and then he was like he died, but he was like elevated over the water, yeah. so they found it, and it was in this case oh, that like preserved it. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I think that's one of the most like incredible artifacts of violin. Yeah, and then I mean, obviously, a lot of these things are sold at auction too. So that one is that the most expensive one that? So I think it's it is. That was one point seven yeah. million dollars. That's a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing they did find at the ocean floor was the binoculars, which no one had. I know. It's, hor- it's horribly ironic. It's so bad. <laughs> they were locked. So they couldn't <laughs> access them. Um, yeah. And Francis Fleet, who, who sounded the initial alarm, I think later said was like, well, if we'd had binoculars. And I think there's some debate about that. Oh, yeah. It was really dark and like how much would binoculars right. have helped. Maybe. They prob- maybe but a he, little. He, he pretty much always stuck to that idea, Frederick Fleet, that if he... Yeah, he's he always stuck to it. If he had had binoculars, he said it never would have happened, mm. which his story doesn't end well either, because he basically just had survivor's guilt his whole oh. life and then killed himself. Oh, gosh. I mean, that's so, yeah. pretty heavy to be the guy who, like, spotted the iceberg that, you know, took down the yeah. Titanic. Especially, well, especially, too, because a lot of... Not that I would hold him accountable for it, but the people who, like... You think of like the captain, Mm -hmm. um, the people from White Star Line, these people who were in positions of power and who should have maybe prepared better. They most of them died with the ship. Right. But then Frederick Fleet's the one who lived and happened to. I can see where that connection of where that guilt would come from. I don't think he, uh, you know, needed to feel guilty. Absolutely. I mean, I wonder um, it's because like he didn't have the binoculars because the guy with the binocular case key wasn't on the ship. So I wonder what that guy. Yeah, he got fired. I think, I think so. Yeah, like right beforehand, and then just kind of was like, "Oh, whoops, got the key with me." Still, I'm sure it's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I wonder yeah. if he was ever like, "Oh man, like that was." If he felt guilty about that, or if that, I don't, I don't know very much about him. Yeah, it'd be really interesting. I yeah, I kind of want to see now if there was like an interview with him or anything at any point. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, they found all sorts of other stuff in the wreck. Also, I guess a lot of the stuff they did, they did recover like shortly after the ship first sank. I guess one interesting thing is um, there's this guy's like letter to his wife. And this was actually sent from yeah. Southampton. So it was before the ship sank. But he's he's going over an event that we touched on in the first episode about how when the Titanic launched, there was almost a collision with another ship. And at the time, a couple right. of the sailors on board the Titanic were disconcerted by it. Because <laughs> it seemed like a bad omen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, especially when your captain is the guy who was responsible for a different shipwreck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that could make you <laughs> uneasy. Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's not the ideal workplace. No. It, <laughs> but yeah, it is really interesting um, because obviously, it, like most other letters aren't going to have survived. So it is kind of interesting to get that perspective to retroactively look back and see all these warnings and like pieces of irony mm. from beforehand with like like Captain Smith being like, well, I don't think any vessel could sink anymore because of the way ships are built. Mm-hmm. And it's like, hey, buddy, maybe don't, don't say, say that out loud. stuff like yeah, that. Don't tempt fate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Carry a piece of wood with you to knock on if you're going to do yeah. that. The letter is really sad, too, because he's like, he's like, love you. We'll write to you from New York in a couple of days. And you're like, oh, it's really tragic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, speaking of tragic, another thing that uh, sometimes I've seen this couple compared to like Jack and Rose. It was a it was a Jewish couple coming to the United States, like start their new lives. He dies. She doesn't. He dies with a pocket watch on him, which he has to like fight to get back from White Star Lines. But it's a really, it's another like very like, it's just like a piece that was so important to a family. And you can see yeah. it as like Hebrew markings on it. And that I think also sold at auction down the line. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Pocket watches were very like, I mean, even watches are still, they're so important to people. Mm-hmm. People put a lot of value into watches, partly because watches are so expensive, I think. But um, I mean, you have to think back at that point in time. Like now, we, I think we kind of take it for granted because we have phones or like I have a smart watch that does a million different things. But back then, that was just how you told Tom. Mm-hmm. You just had this thing with you and that was like your you, you spend so much time looking at it, of course, you're going to attach some value. Yeah, well, especially if it's your loved one's watch, it must be very, you right. know, it's, it's a part of them because it's always on them. So, right. Yeah, right. And it's one of and be in I think especially more so because it was always on them. It's like, sure, you know, I have some socks 
mm-hmm. he wore at home or whatever it is. But it's like, no, that watch was always with right. him to the point where, it, yeah, it was a part of them. Yeah. It kind of brings up the question. Some of these artifacts don't really apply to what I want to touch on. But like, but like, like <laughs> yeah. should you be taking this stuff from the ocean floor or should it be left alone? Like Robert Ballard is like, leave it alone. He said, you know, we don't dig yeah. up Gettysburg, so why take this stuff from this, like, side of a tragedy? Which I think is really interesting. Obviously, the stuff has been taken, yeah. and the ship itself is slowly disintegrating, so... I think, yeah, it's complicated because you want to get certain things from the wreckage to return them to the family, ideally, like a pocket watch or whatever it might be, you know. It's, it's different because it's the ocean, too, I guess, because it's not, like, a marked site. Mm-hmm. That you can still go to Gettysburg and, you know, see it and be there. And um, the memory of that is like preserved in the land, whereas this, like you said, is kind of slowly disintegrating into nothingness. So maybe it is better to pull it from the ocean and to put it somewhere where it can be memorialized yeah, better. I guess and I don't really know too much about who is going down there and taking stuff. But it seems like if someone is doing that, it should not be going to auction, maybe like maybe like a museum. Yeah, that's where I get weird about it is when people are like buying Will- Wallace Hartley's violin yeah. for nearly two million dollars. It's like, why do you want that? Yeah, I mean, it's really cool, but I think it should be in a museum. I think it. Let me see. It might be in a museum unless it was bought by a museum for that much money. But after it was salvaged, Hartley's fiance gifted the violin to a music teacher before it was sold at auction for one point seven million. Oh. oh, so then a member so it was anonymously purchased, but what? I think it's at the Titanic Museum now. Okay. Hmm. The Branson Museum and a sister facility in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. So it is at a museum. Okay, that's good. Okay. Well, that's yeah. fine then. But yeah, I think all this stuff should definitely be preserved and like on display, I guess, somewhere if it's if it's not too fragile. Yeah, I mean, when some of the things they recovered too are so like, like the they have the ship plan mm-hmm. for it. Which is very cool. Yeah, that is really cool. I think one of the weirdest things recovered is just the big piece, the 15 ton mm. section of the ship. And it's like, OK, I mean, it's cool, but like, yeah, it's a weird thing to have pulled that out. Right. It's been hard to get out. Yeah. I felt like it, that to me feels like um, they were just showing off. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's wild. After I was looking through uh, some of the artifacts and stuff, I looked at pictures of the wreck and it is like very haunting yeah i mean it's, yeah it's like all the metal is like rusted yeah, and coated yeah. in barnacles and stuff it's like otherworldly it is almost. i think that's well, we'll get into reasons why this fascinates people later but i think that's one reason uh, uh, wrecks i think are fascinating in general yeah and then i guess before we move on to another kind of the discussion like one other thing we wanted to touch on was that there was a guy and this this plan seems to be defunct now from what i can tell but there was a guy who wanted to make the titanic too an exact replica of the Titanic, yeah. although bigger, and have right. it set sail. And it seems like it just couldn't really get off the ground based on... Underst- well, <laughs> couldn't get off the ground. I was There's, there's <laughs> yeah, a joke there. there. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't get out of a, out of port or something. Couldn't get... Yeah, couldn't get enough wind in his yeah. sails or... Yes, fire yeah. in its engines. But it seems to not be happening. But it was sort of an interesting idea, I thought. Like a morbid one, but interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It... it <sighs> capitalizing on tragedy by remaking it feels so weird to me. Yeah. Um, I did go to when I was in Cherbourg, France, which is one of the stops the Titanic made before it went. I went to the Titanic Museum there, which actually was really, really cool. Um, hmm. You know, you could walk through different like rooms of like first class or third class. But the entire time, the perimeter of the museum, there was like a clock ca- ca- counting down to 1140, which is when the ship hit the iceberg. And then there was water like a light show of water rising. And oh, so really it hits cool. the iceberg and then the water like starts to rise as like the time goes on throughout the entire museum, like with lights and shadows and stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's very so cool. neat. Yeah. Um, highly recommend if anyone's in the uh, Cherbourg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that kind of stuff's cool when it's like, I don't know, you, you tell the line between commemorative and then like capitalizing on something, um, which is why I think Titanic two was a very bad idea. Mm-hmm. Just make another ship. Just make a big sh- if you have the money. Don't call it Titanic two. Right. And then if something bad happens to it, it's like oh. Okay, everyone's be like, well, you're kind of asking for it, naming a ship to, for a doomed ship. Yeah, and, yeah. I yeah. mean, I do think I would love to go to the Titanic Museum in Belfast, which I've heard is really great. But the one in France definitely was cool, and I guess that's a, uh, I think a great way of commemorating and displaying some of this stuff. 
Yeah. I'm also curious about how much of the cultural fascination around this and um, is because of the movie also. Mm -hmm. I know, like, obviously the discovery of it was 20, 12 years before the movie came out. But um, when somebody gets the idea to do Titanic 2, is it because they like the history or is it because it's one of the highest grossing movies of all time? Probably contributed to it. Yeah. I mean, I think the fascination with the Titanic is like predates the movie just because there was like another movie before James Cameron did it, you right. know, and, like books and stuff. But yeah, I think I think you're probably right. It's like they're just trying to make a book. It's just an interesting um, thing to think about. But obviously, like, as we've been discussing it so much lately, like the Titanic was like a really monumental tragedy mm -hmm. that like impacted the course of history, like multiple yeah. ways through pop culture, through the actual way ships were built. Definitely. I mean, yeah, it, it did. It did change history. Like, the biggest thing and the most immediate thing, I think, was that these investigations tried to find out, like, why did it sink? And how can we stop this from happening ever again? And, you know, they found, right. you know, there were factors that led to the sinking, which were just kind of like pure bad luck on the one hand and uh, just a bunch of different little things. But then there were things that they could change, like, OK, we're going to have 24 hour radio operators now because, you know, people were missing messages. Their, the ships weren't getting the distress signal because people had gone to bed. And then have right. enough lifeboats on a boat, like <laughs> that's important. Let's make that a lot. And that was an active. That was an active choice they made. Yeah. Too. Well, but it like, they made that For, choice, like, but uh, also they were within the law. They had more than enough lifeboats based on what the law was right, at the time, right. even though it wasn't enough for everybody on board. So then they, they changed those things, and those I think were some of the biggest like immediate changes after the ship sank. Yeah, I mean it's like putting a seatbelt in a car, mm -hmm. like. It's not enough just to have one for the driver. Every seat needs to have a seatbelt because presumably we saw what happened when they did. Right. Yeah. Make things safer. Yeah. I mean, this I guess this is a good segue point to into the next thing we're talking about. But it was also such an international tragedy. You know, radio was still kind of a new technology right. at the time. But word of the sinking spread, the, the victims were from different parts of the world. You know, there's a lot of immigrants on the ship from all sorts of places. American British as well, you know, so it really touched um, a huge part of the global population, which was kind of big and new. Yeah, because normally things just happen to people from other countries. And yeah, it's more you local, you know, like, care that much. Yeah, yeah, this was this was like an international tragedy. And it was yeah. shared in a way that really things hadn't been shared before. Right. Yeah. A unifying yeah. tragedy. In a way. Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why it really is stuck in people's craw, so to speak, and just like, you know, we still talk about the Titanic because it was so big at the time. Right. Yeah. But there's a lot of reasons why I think the sinking has continued to kind of fascinate people. I mean, one thing, you know, I've read is that like, it sort of marked like a really tragic end to like, quote unquote, like good years, because then World War One breaks yeah. out in 1914. And that was bad. And that was bad for a really long time. Right. So there's that. I think the thing that I find most fascinating is like, wh what would you do on a sinking ship? Like all these people are just minding their own business. And then what do you, what do you do? How do you react? And people react in such different ways right. to the sinking. Yeah. And I, and even as we've said over the past 40 minutes, several times, like some of these people reacted in ways that are so like they were pre-written mm -hmm. the band continuing to play. Um, the people who like selflessly helped each other, a, an elderly couple who chose to die together rather than have one of them live. All of those things are sort of, I mean, any one of those things on its own could be in any number of stories from the dawn of time. Mm -hmm. But they all happen over the course of what is effectively like two and a half hours. Yeah, definitely. Like the movie is longer than the actual yeah. sinking of the Titanic <laughs> was. No, you have people like Molly Brown who like pitched in and then people, you know, like, you know, Bruce Ismay got a lot of flack for for surviving the sinking, um, the White Star Line executive, if you're getting into a lifeboat. Ed, the captain, right. Edward Smith, it's unclear kind of how he um, reacted to it. Even people like people like Eugene Daly, who we covered in the series, who's just like an Irish guy, you know, just trying to get to the United States. Like, his reaction was like, get into a lifeboat, like, escape. 
And that's a perfectly valid reaction yeah. when, you know, your ship is sinking. Totally. Yeah. I mean, that's. <laughs> I but then there were the people like the baker Sorry, who yes. like he was like, well, like he got really drunk. But he's also like, I'm going to throw these like chairs in the water and try to like help people. Yeah. And... His story is my favorite one. <laughs> this is pretty good. <laughs> it's just such a it's just such a great reaction. Just be like, oh, we're going down. All right. And just pour a drink. And, yeah. And ironically, it saved his life, that's too. That's what they think. Yeah. Because it kept him warm. So like that's it's like I, I laughed the first time I read it just because like that's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess the final thing is just that the Titanic was so luxurious and not only luxurious, but it was the biggest ship like ever for the fact that it to right. go down. It's like there's like an Icarus type lesson it seems like almost yeah. you know yeah some sort of like moral thing um that you could pull out of the story sure. if you wanted to it draws a lot of parallels to um the hindenburg it echoes the hindenburg disaster in so many ways where it was this luxurious massive thing going around the world and then ended in just such a horrible horrible way ball of flames yeah yeah feel less bad about that one because it had a swastika on the side right <laughs> but um <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you can see those sort, same sorts of like they thought that was going to be the next massive thing that everyone was going to be having these airships. And, and um, so many times in satire, uh, like the man in the high castle, things like that, where you, you, you know, those alternate histories, the Nazis won. And what would the world look like? Mm -hmm. Zeppelins are such a, a thing <laughs> in those kinds of stories, because like that was what Germany was focused on, were these blimps basically and yeah. every, the rest of the world was like yeah well we have like airplanes <laughs> right and you have to you have to wonder like you have to wonder like how how different would i mean even had the hindenburg disaster not happened and had it not been a um or had that technology continued to develop post nazi germany would we still attach them to get I, i'm i'm going off on a totally separate tangent but i just think it's really yeah, interesting it point is interesting to discuss. i mean i think i don't know much about the history of like like marine time, marine time history and like how the Titanic changed, I guess because planes were sort of like moving into the forefront at the moment that it sank. Um, because during world war one, there were planes. They still weren't like passenger airplanes. No, though. but that was like, that was what was next. So I think this era of, yeah. uh, traveling by ship was becoming less and less and less. And if the Titanic, like maybe it sort of rushed that a little bit. I don't know. I don't really know the answer to that. But. Right. No, no, but that's, I mean, obviously people still travel by boat, but it's pretty much only luxury now. It's not like if you're going to go to England, you're not going to go by boat most likely. I mean, you, you have to be a bit eccentric um, to be like, oh, I'm going to get on a boat from New York to London. It's like, oh, okay, that's right, an interesting right. choice. That's going to take like a lot longer than flying. And also probably be more cost effective to fly. And, yeah. But yeah, if, I mean, you, if you look at it that way, like, again i don't know but were was the faith in boats then diminished because they were like well this one this was the boat to end all boats mm -hmm. and it sank right so what does that mean it, in the same way that the hindenburg was like oh okay well maybe this is the future never mind mm -hmm. <laughs> not not gonna do that and now we have planes which are the safest way to travel that have ever existed i think too i'm pretty sure that a lot of these titanic like ships were also like commandeered for World War One purposes? Probably. I'm pretty sure. It's ringing a bell. Well, I guess, you know, we did a lot of research about the Titanic over the last couple of weeks. What, since, like, February did we start? building the series and talking about it with everyone i think so yeah um yeah so yeah i guess i'll throw the question to you and then i can answer but what were there, were there things that you found like surprising in this research especially having not seen the movie right yeah because all i knew was that it sank <laughs> <laughs> i knew it hit an iceberg and it sank well i didn't know about the women and children first mm -hmm. rule um so I, that was just a thing that i learned over the course of this I think I just never understood quite how big the Titanic actually was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, huge. Um, how many passengers were on board and all of the executive decisions behind the way things played out, mm -hmm. like not having enough lifeboats um, with Captain Smith potentially 
ignoring warnings about ice in the water um, with the radio lines being so busy that ships were literally like shut yeah. up <laughs> to right. each other because, um, yeah, I think it's just in my mind before this, it was always just ship hit iceberg sank and it was sad. Yeah. And I didn't quite understand the the real impact of that or why it mattered so mm -hmm. much. Yeah, a lot of layers to the story. Yeah, and I think that was what was most surprising. Yeah. But yeah, I'll throw it back to you. Well, we sort of touched on this a bit a couple of minutes ago, but, you know, I guess I knew the story. I have seen the movie. I think I've seen it at least once. I might have seen it more than once. And I was just, I, I was surprised and I shouldn't have been, but I was really surprised just how many, yeah, like primary sources, firsthand accounts were out there. Yeah. You know, survivors yeah. talked about it. You know, R. Norris Williams, who, who broke the door with his shoulder, like, he didn't talk about it, but he, he wrote like a very short biography of his life before he died and like 35 pages and he mentioned the Titanic and that's there. And he's this incredible quote about being in the water and seeing the ship, you know, go up and then slowly sink down. And like, that's amazing. Yeah. And like reading this stuff really brings it home to be like, this, this is what I was doing when this happened or Eugene Daly talking about someone like firing at the crowd. We found, I think we saw some really good firsthand accounts of what people saw in, in witness, which made, I don't know, made the research really fascinating for me. Yeah. I mean, yeah, as we read over everything and put it together, it you can see why it was made into a movie because it plays oh, yeah. out like one. So much drama. Easily. Yeah. It, and you almost I almost wonder why James Cameron even bothered making characters up mm -hmm. for a movie. Because right. like you, you could you really couldn't. Have, I mean, you could have just made the movie with the actual people who were there, just made it like a full. Yeah. Like biopic. But for a track like I don't know if you can still call it a biopic if it's about a boat, but <laughs> a boat will pick. Um, yeah, yeah. Like a reenactment. Th at that well, point. there was a movie, I think, in the I want to say the 50s, but I really have no idea when it was made. Uh, a Night to Remember, which I wonder if that was a bit more just like what's going on, like on the ship and not focused on like a love story on top of that. I mean, I think the love story is yeah. what made the Titanic sort of like next level. Yeah. I mean, hey, it's one of the highest grossing movies of all time. Yeah. And I, so <laughs> clearly they did something, something right. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was also really like, I, I didn't know very much about the two ships that uh, were near the Titanic, uh, the Carpathia, mm -hmm. which came to their rescue in the California, which did not, even though it was much closer. Right. And I think learning because because on the Carpathia, like the guy, the radio guy, he was about to go to bed. Like it was it was good luck that he heard this distress signal. And right. on the other side of that coin, the Californian guy had just gone to bed because he'd been yelled at by the Titanic operator. So that was bad luck, you know, and so it's like tiny right, things right. that like all contributed to the tragedy. Yeah. And it's stuck. And stuff you just don't even like it makes no sense to me as a modern person to not have 24 hour radio operators mm -hmm. on a boat to have like a shift where someone can just not be able to contact your boat. Yeah, now. it's a really interesting point. And I wonder if it's because people just weren't used to having 24 hour contact, you know, because like I, I think that's probably part yeah, of it. But that obviously made like a huge difference. Yeah. Which kind of brings us to our next point, which is who, who is to blame for the Titanic? Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's tough. I mean, there's so much stuff about the captain that's like he has to, at least in my opinion, take some of the blame yeah. on that. He was found not guilty of negligence, but he was the boat was right. going really fast and there were a lot of icebergs around. So it seemed like things he should have been aware right. of, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. I think it seems like all these like little things really added up. And then there's like a mystery. There's some mysteries of like, well, why were they going so fast? Was it because as one theory states, there's like a fire in the boiler room and were they trying to like, I don't know, deal with that somehow? Right. I read a theory that when when Francis Fleet yelled iceberg, the guy turned the boat in the wrong direction and hit the iceberg instead of avoiding yeah. it. Like these these little things that maybe yeah, we he, don't know. And that was yeah. then that was just like a moment of confusion. It was like, um, I think he mixed up unless I'm confusing this with another boat thing because we've been talking about a lot of boats <laughs> but he tried to do like a hard a starboard maneuver mm -hmm. this might be another boat it sounds no 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 you're right you're right so it says okay according to a claim made by louise Patton, who's the granddaughter of charles lightoller she says one of the ship's crew members panicked after hearing the order to turn hard a starboard he became confused and turned the wrong way directly toward the ice okay that's cool she says that's what i was thinking of then i guess the big things were the speed and that they that they these iceberg warnings were ignored i think the bigger things yeah really was that the californian was right there and that they didn't come to their rescue 
even though they saw the emergency flares and they're like, no, well, they're they're probably just having a party, you know, like it's probably yeah. nothing, um, which is insane. Yeah. But it seems like had, had they responded, yeah. maybe the crash would not have been as catastrophic as it was. Yeah, because you would have been able to, to just get yeah more people. Exactly. But you could have even used the Californians lifeboats. And I mean, yeah, so many what ifs in that scenario. Yeah. Right. But then but then, yeah, you do have those like executive decisions as well to like not have as many lifeboats on board. Um, People have talked about just the actual construction of the ship being kind of oversold, Mm -hmm. which I mean, think of how many movies, video games, uh, pieces of technology, things come out now that are like hyped up. Sure. And over promise and under deliver. The Titanic's just another example of one of those things where they were like, it's unsinkable. Uh, it's the most luxurious cruise liner on the planet. And, and the way we designed it, this thing would never break apart. And even people who saw it go underwater were like, no, it, it didn't break, though. It's still mm. in one piece. And then they found it and it wasn't. It was in two pieces yeah. because the the bolts right. stripped. Yeah, I know. It's I think it's like it's just a series of like unfortunate events and decisions. <laughs> <laughs> In the end, it's just a lemony snicket book. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know. I, I just yeah, I don't think there is any one person to blame. I feel bad that Frederick Fleet get, like bared the brunt of a lot of that guilt mm-hmm. in his life because um, that's just like I get it. But that is really unfortunate. Yeah, definitely. If he was someone who had so little say in like all these bigger things about the Titanic that doomed it. Right. And he wasn't even the only lookout. There was a there were two of them up mm-hmm. there. So it's. Yeah. Well, I guess this won't this might not be a cheery note to end on, depending on what stories we pick. But <laughs> we we're going to talk about some of the fa- our favorite stories from the sinking. You mentioned Charles Jockins. Yeah, that, that's easily my favorite. Yeah, story. that's pretty good. I think he deserves his own movie. Yeah. I, I looked up or like a spinoff I, TV series. I Googled, um, is he in the Titanic films? I didn't remember. And I guess he, he does have like scenes of like, like with a flask or something. And then there's a scene yeah. where the he's ship, not like called out. But. Yeah. The ship is like, it's when it's like vertical and Jack and Rose are like mm-hmm. clinging to the very top and she l- looks to her left and there's a guy there. Apparently that's supposed to be him. So, <laughs> oh, <okay. yeah. laughs> for when you watch the movie, that's him. Yeah. See, that's something I would have done different James. <laughs> yeah. And more of a. I'd put him in more. Yeah. I'd put more of. He'd have been my. He would have been my main character. That would have been an interesting, interesting movie. <laughs> I think you should make that. Maybe. Not too late. Just call it Titanic Two: The Drunk yeah. Chef. Yeah. I wonder what he did afterwards. I don't know what his story was afterwards. Oh, actually, I do. I don't actually. I don't know the story, but I know that he lived into his seventies. I, I read well, that. Story. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I knew. I know he survived. I don't know. Yeah. Probably continued working as a baker, just not on a ship, I'd imagine. I would imagine, though. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I think we mentioned this already as well, but another anecdote I like, although it's kind of a dark one, is like the the Californian was talking to the Titanic and they're like, hey, did you hear about this thing? But the Titanic operators were so busy and like you could only send, I think, like one message at a time and receive one at a time. But the guy, the mm-hmm. main guy, Phillips, was like, shut up, shut up. I'm like trying to work. And the Californian guy was like, oh, fine. OK. And then he's like, I'm done for the night. Close this thing. Then they hit the iceberg. Yeah. And it's not funny exactly, but it's just like, oh, boy, I don't know. For some reason, I, that always like really stuck with me. He's like, shut up, shut up. Yeah. And then, it's just like the, yeah, the irony of it. And I think <laughs> like reading some of the other quotes and the way people, I mean, obviously people speak differently now than we used mm-hmm. to. I think there's just some it, there's something kind of horribly funny about the fact that he was just like, shut yeah, up. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. Because it's the the one thing that maybe didn't change about the way we talk. Yeah. That's but true. yeah, it, 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 it is. It's like a weird modern outlier that is also just like bitterly ironic. And it's another one of those things that like in hindsight, you're like, oh, come on. Yeah. Right. But I think I think the um the whole story about the radio operators is really interesting too yeah. with um harold bride mm-hmm. leaving and philip staying behind and then him sharing that story being like yeah i saw him still in the engine room as it was flooding and being able to like tell that story to other people yeah yeah they definitely played a heroic role in the end the two of them um especially phillips sending messages and waiting till the end right yeah um another of my favorite stories is 
back to the Carpathia, but just like the captain. Because uh, at first, when the when their radio operator was like, the Titanic's in trouble, everyone was like, what? No, that's not possible. Um, the ship's not supposed to be able to sink. You know, maybe you got the message wrong. But the captain was like, all right, let's 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 go. Let's get there. And they were going, like, so quickly that they were, like, pushing their ship to, like, the very limits. And that they had icebergs around them, too. Right. But he was, I think, brave and unlucky to to survive that, like, very quick rescue mission. Yeah. Yeah. The ways that people step up is really, yeah. like admirable a lot of the time definitely my one of my one of my favorite stories is the opposite of that <laughs> um uh-huh. i think i think it was Lu- lucille carter uh whose husband just kind of left uh-huh. her her and her kids they just was he was like all right see oh. ya um, you're on your own and then they saw him again on the carpathia oh and oh, i forget exactly what he said it was something just kind of rude mm. Where he was just like, wow, didn't expect to see you again. Oh my God. <laughs> Hope they got divorced. Uh, so they divorced shortly after. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. That really kind of shows some of the character. I was thinking, too, just uh, about like Bruce Ismay, who we mentioned, like getting off the ship and then just like being like hysterical on mm-hmm. the Carpathia being like, I should have gone down with the ship. Like, I shouldn't have survived. And he was found like the investigation was like, look, the ship was sinking. He had no other choice but to jump off. So, like, that's right. You know, he was allowed to try to save his own life. But other people didn't make that choice. Like, Thomas Andrews, the designer, decided to go down with the ship, it seemed. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't think you can blame anyone for not going down with the ship. Because I, I know that's like a, a captain always goes down with his ship, sort of like that honorable thing. Um, I, w- I would never blame anyone no, sure. for not wanting to die. Yeah. But, but Isney was so. really like just criticized in the press and for that well sure i mean he became the fall guy for white star lines too yeah i'm sure like that was a big part of it is they were like how could you let this happen Mm -hmm. it wasn't just him making these decisions i know he was like a prominent voice but yeah it was a lot of a lot of different stuff yeah i don't know if there's anything else you want to touch on before we start wrapping up no i just um i'm surprised how much i came to care about this mm. story because uh, again i it was something i was just rather indifferent to forever beyond knowing the basics of what happened but then i as we started to get more and more into it amidst the <laughs> the um confusing nature of trying to like coordinate all these overlapping stories right. over the course of five episodes of something i was like wow there is like a lot here and a lot to go on and a lot of like really interesting and dramatic and at times like really heartbreaking stories that again maybe we wouldn't have known as much had there not been so many firsthand accounts of Mm -hmm. it either right and i think that you know the value of that can't be understated here but it is like it's worth looking into yeah definitely more than i ever thought it would definitely definitely and you know i know this is gonna sound like really corny but i can't think of another way to say it like our our series is only like the tip of the iceberg when it comes to (laughs) titanic stuff you know there's so much we covered a lot i think and we did a good job of like getting into the weeds with certain people's stories and um, what happened to the ship at different times during the sinking but there's so much information there and there's so many stories a lot of them are on our site too so there's like that um but there's there's like so much here it's not surprising to me that this was a movie because yeah it's just yeah packed with drama i mean now if it were nowadays you'd you'd make this as like a six-part series oh sure hbo hbo or something like yeah yeah. that'd be cool someone should do that there's enough there for it to stay (laughs) i'm sure they will (laughs) yeah That'd be really cool. Um, but there, there is. There's enough there. Like for for an event that lasted two hours, mm-hmm. the amount of like time you can spend looking into it is exponentially longer. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think our series is longer than two hours in total. All six episodes, definitely. Yeah, probably. I think so. If not, very close to it. So yeah, yeah. But it's been cool. It's been a really fun fun journey. Like learning more about the titanic and and putting this all together yeah i'm excited i think our what's our we do have another series planned we do. i think it's ufos I, right on i think it's the ufo cases which i'm like really excited <laughs> for yeah that's gonna be i know we've talked about it before but i am a tinfoil hat believer mm. all right that should be interesting because i'm like a huge skeptic about this stuff <laughs> <laughs> that's fair that's fair i get into debates with my girlfriend all the time about whether or not ghosts are real oh, are you on the pro ghost Okay. For I sure. I think I believe in ghosts, but I don't believe in aliens. That's interesting. 
That's interesting because one definitely has more of a basis in science. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to these, hopefully all six episodes on the Titanic. But if you just listened to this one, thanks. And hopefully you knew what we were talking about. Um, if you're interested in learning more about any of the things we talked about here or in any of our other episodes, you can find sort of deeper dives into this on all this uh, You can find us on Facebook at History Revealed on Instagram at Real History Uncovered and on TikTok at Real History Uncovered. And personal note, would really appreciate some views on those TikToks. <laughs> I've been putting so much time into some them. Some of them have a lot of views. <laughs> it's so funny. Some of them, I don't really know some why are, some have a lot and some don't have a lot. Everyone's loving that uh, Floyd Collins it's one. It's so surprising that that's the one that... And it's, I think it's a really good like one. There's like three pictures in it. I'm surprised that... It, that's the one. Uh, yeah, of all the things, I yeah. know. Not complaining, but yeah, there are some really cool ones up there, and they're I mean, all little yeah. like snippets of our of uh, the podcast and stories from the site and everything. So definitely check those out. Yeah, and if uh, you know if you liked this podcast, you can always give us a rating. Mm-hmm. That helps us and helps us make better content for the show as well. Yeah, yeah, so, it helps our self esteem and it the helps word. people find the podcast. So it does. It does. <laughs> Just saying, I could really use it some days. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye.